Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Welcome to uh, the Centre for Ukrainian and Canadian Studies, St. Andrews College. And uh, the other uh, sponsor of this evening is Durham Islamic Studies from the University of Manitoba. Um, I'm Elaine Flaherty, and I'm just so happy to uh, be able to introduce to you people that a uh, person you probably know better than I do. Um, I actually met Miroslav in New York at Columbia University. I didn't know that he was from U of M when I met him. It was at a conference. And I was really impressed with what he was speaking about. When I found out that he was here, I was hoping to get to hear him lecture at some point. Today's the first time that I get to hear you in your hometown, for me anyway. So thank you so much for, for uh, doing this for us. Um, I, just if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about Miroslav. Dr. Miroslav Skandri is a professor of Slavic studies, Russian and Ukrainian, University of Manitoba, and former head of the Department of German and Slavic Studies at the University of Manitoba. He's published widely on literature and art, cultural politics, the avant-garde, and nationalism, and is best known for his work on the intersection of literature, politics, and art. His books include Ukrainian Nationalism, Politics, Ideology, and Literature, uh, published by Yale University, Jews in Ukrainian Literature, Representati Representation and Identity, also by Yale University, and he's got another list that I won't read all off. He's also um, has his works curated in different curated exhi exhibitions, including Propaganda and Slogans, The Political Poster, in Soviet Ukraine, 1919 to 1921, That's in New York, the Ukrainian Museum, 2013. Um, he's done translations into English, uh, different books. Uh, it's just a real honor to be able to have him speak with us here tonight. And so, what we'll do is we'll ask you to speak for you know 30 to 40 minutes, if you don't mind. We could probably have a day or two, but that's all we have this evening. And then we'll invite you, uh, Dr. And we will invite some questions, and all together we'll probably spend about an hour in that, and then maybe we can have some coffee and tea and light discussion after. So, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. Um, I'll try and uh, keep it short. Um, this is really a very controversial topic. It is uh, a hot topic in Ukraine and a hot topic internationally. There are two really conflicting views of the OUN, Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, and the UPA, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army. One is uh, condemnatory, totally condemnatory, and the other one is celebratory. And what's interesting in dealing with this is that they're really uh, opposite poles, opposite ends of the spectrum. It's uh, a subject that I'm going to talk about in terms of this, uh, this, uh, this, this conflict. And there are three areas, maybe four areas, that are very important. First one is the 1930s. What was the ideology of Oman? Was it a fascist organization? Basically, that's, that's the, the question. What was it propagating in the 1930s? What did it do in the Second World War? Was the OUN responsible for the pogroms in 1941 when Hitler's troops invaded and Jews were, were, were killed? Was it complicit in the, in the Holocaust? And then in Volinia, in 1943, uh, according to the Polish, according to the Polish uh, Senate, passed a, a law, a resolution, saying that the Ogun was responsible for genocide of Poles, ethnic cleansing, genocide of Poles, in uh, Volinia, 1943. So this, this is the controversial condemnatory discourse. Then there's a, what I, I see as a celebratory discourse. And this is really the defense of the population in uh, in uh, eastern Poland, in the Zakarzonia, those parts of Poland that were ethnically Ukrainian, uh, just beyond the Curzon line, where there was where the Poles were shipping out Ukrainians, and at that point, the UPA, the underground, supported 
the local resistance. And they've gone down in history uh, in that area as heroes. So you have two completely different uh, narratives about the Oun and Upa. And the interesting thing is how those narratives are being created, reformulated, developed today. So on the plane from Ukraine, the last two days I read this book. It's a collection of articles that appeared in the uh, Ukrainska Pravda. Oh no, yeah, Ukrainska uh, Historia. And it was really a, it, it was really sort of a intriguing to see how they presented this. They showed how different people from completely different parts of the political spectrum and different views all contributed to this debate. And you have in this collection of articles, which is up on the website, on, the, on their website, how they really uh, conflicted with one another. The articles that got the greatest number of hits on their website, Istration Problem, were um, to do with Oun and Upa. So you have a constant debate going on. You've got a very important and a very controversial book published by Vietrovich that appeared recently and that has fueled this debate. He's been attacked uh, quite strongly by mainly the Poles because he claims that the events in Volinia in 1943 were not ethnic cleansing on the part of the Ukrainians. They were a continuation of a Polish-Ukrainian war that had been going on since the beginning of the 20th century. This book has been translated into Polish. Uh, here it is. And it has fueled further debates in Poland. And you also have Oksana Zabushko, who uh, recently produced a novel, a uh, very well-received novel, in which she shows the Upa as heroes. So in all these, uh, in all these contexts, cultural history is being produced, is being developed, is being rewritten, and the Oun and Upa the, our concepts of the Oun and Upa are being uh, recreated, reformulated. So, if we look at the difficult history, the events in Volinia, this is a postcard that was produced about 1939, uh, showing the struggle for of the underground, of the Oun and the underground, for liberation. This is a leaflet that was passed around recently, in 2016, in Poland, showing uh, the Oun, or Ukrainians, as killers. And that just sort of gives you the, 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 the range of options there, the, 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 the shows you how different people view, uh, view these events. So I'm going to tell, tell you about Vietrovich's, a little bit about Vietrovich's point of view and where the weaknesses are, in my opinion, in this presentation uh, that Vietrovich puts forward. First of all, uh, Poles do not accept that the losses were equal on both sides. According to Polish scholarships, scholarship, uh, the losses on the Polish side were much, much higher, 60,000, maybe 100,000 in, in this Polish-Ukrainian conflict, whereas the Ukrainian losses were far lower, 16,000 or so. And the reason why they say it is because this was actually a cleansing operation, ethnic cleansing operation in Volinia. The Oun told its uh, soldiers who, or its uh, policemen who were serving in the, in the German police to defect and go into the underground. They became the core of the Ukrainian army, the uh, insurgent army, UPA, and according to the Polish scholarship, according to the Polish, uh, general Polish point of view, they then began their 
their, um, their activities by pushing up the Polish population. And the Poles, Polish scholarship does not buy the idea that it was equivalent. They see this as, uh, as uh, a, an attempt to really f get rid of all, all the Poles. The Red Army was advancing at the time. There was fear that the Poles would uh, reclaim that territory at the end of the war. To prevent that from happening, a decision was taken to get rid of it. That's the Polish uh, view. And uh, this is not something that Vietravich believes. He is now supporting this idea of equivalence. It was a battle. People died on both sides. The other thing about Vietravich's book is that everything is all un bad. He doesn't uh, uh, accept or even talk, even mention the existence of the Open prior to the split between the Banderites and the Mendicites uh, on the eve of the Second World War. He doesn't talk about the splits that happened later. Uh, he doesn't accept anything. It's all Open Bear. So it's really an apology, apologism for the Open Bear. He also doesn't talk anything. He doesn't say anything about the Holocaust, and uh, the, as I'm going to explain, one of the accusations against the nationalists, particularly the Open Bear, the Banderites, is that they were uh, complicit in the Holocaust. He also, well, he comes close to saying that actually the Open Bear leadership and the UPA did give instructions to start a cleansing operation. He blames it and really ignited a, a war within a war against the Poles. He blames this on Klim Sabur, uh, a man called, that, that was his pseudonym, a man called Kleszkowski, whom he says, who he says, um, did not listen to the centra, central leadership of Kupa, but decided to act on his own. However, he does not explain why the Upa leadership then went along with this later. Um, and uh, there's very little recognition of Ukrainian guilt. He does point out that there are some, there were some incidents that were horrific, and he, he recognizes that. But there's no re overall recognition of Ukrainian guilt um, and responsibility. And he certainly does not say this was uh, ethnic cleansing or genocide. So <clears throat> these are what these are his arguments, the ones that are challenged by polls. So I will just tell you a little bit about um, the the arguments that are used within this context of Volinia. First of all, uh, there is uh, an argument that on the, the big operation where UPA really cleaned out many villages and worked uh, hard to expel people, took place around July the 11th, 1943, and this is well documented, there were massacres and rapes and so on. The argument is that they had to do this because uh, it was a preemptive move against a planned attack. The Poles were getting ready, the Red Army was coming in, they knew that the power was going to be hit, and so this was a preemptive thing. The Polish do not accept that. The Polish scholars in particular are very angry uh, about, about this, uh, this kind of argumentation. There has been some convergence re recently in the debates, the memory wars, between Poles and Polish and Ukrainian scholars. But as the leading Polish scholar um, on the, this subject, a man called Motyka, says that one thing in Polish-Ukrainian relations that still remains unresolved and, and extremely controversial is this Volinian episode, episode in Volinia. <clears throat> there were there were smaller cleansing operations that took place. The Poles uh, attacked 
various uh, Ukrainian settlements at the time. But the argument on the Polish side is that this was a much minor, much, much more of a, a minor operation and cannot be compared to what happened in, uh, uh, in, uh, to the Poles in Bolivia. The other thing that I mentioned was the Holocaust. In 1941, when the Germans moved in, there were pogroms in Lviv and in Western Ukraine. And the argument is that uh, in those early first days, for example, in Lviv, it was the 1st and 2nd of July, uh, the population ran riot, Jews were, were dragged out of uh, their homes, were, were beaten and killed. Uh, the argument um, is that it had, they all had to be involved because somebody was creating a militia. The old one had the, had the organizational abilities. They had already published prior to the war anti-Jewish statements, and therefore they were the likely candidates for organizing, the, helping to organize these, these programs. So this is um, an accusation that is, has been put forward not, not only by uh, scholars in Poland, but also by the German scholarship, which is now following this and attempting to understand it, looking at the archives, North American scholarship, scholars in Canada uh, and in the United States. In fact, it is now, they're, they're now searching for who uh, could have been uh, the instigator and how this might have happened. But nobody quite knows the chain of command, what really happened in those days so when the Germans moved in, right after uh, these, these programs took place. Was it more of a spontaneous uh, phenomenon? Was it the local crowd that uh, lost, uh, lost con that, that the authorities lost control of? Was it instigated? We're not quite sure. There are photographs and so on, but we don't know. If you look back at the Oton's 1930 and early 1940 statements, there's plenty there to suggest uh, a kind of a, a anti-Semitic um, and uh, pro-fascist or pro-German uh, point of view. The Oton in the 30s defined itself. It was proud of the fact that it was totalitarian that it would come to power as the only party. Uh, it was proud of the fact that it was not anti-democratic, that it was anti-parliamentary. And this was its DNA. So when, it, in the late 30s, about 1938 to 41, it moved, it shifted, that was the point where it shifted most, the closest, to a kind of a proto-fascist position. And there's a scholar in, uh, called Zaitsev, Alexander Zaitsev in Lviv, who argues that it was, it can best be described in those years, 39 to 41, as proto-fascist. If it had come to power, it would have been like the Ustasha in uh, Croatia. It would have been a kind of uh, fascistic uh, group. So it lent in that direction on the eve of the war. But Hitler did not help, did not ha have no intention of letting Ukraine be, in, be, a, be a, an autonomous entity, even within a German ruled Europe. And he began shortly after the invasion, arresting our own members. And it took a while, but by 43, the old one had changed its program. It had gone in a more democratic, uh, anti-imperialist rhetoric towards a more anti-imperialist rhetoric, rhetoric and tone, and it had changed. However, on the eve of the war, the, the rhetoric that it put forward, even in its guidelines, it issued these guidelines in April, how people were to behave during the war, it specified 
that there were enemy peoples, and those enemy peoples were the Russians, the Poles, and the Jews. And you had to be very careful how you dealt with uh, all these people. So it was a very, uh, the, 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 the language and the, the words they used were very inflammatory. And you could see that people who were, you know, young members of the Oruno people who were uh, angry at the Soviet regime, the, the, they would have assimilated this language and be ready, been ready for anti-Jewish violence. So that's the argument. It should also be pointed out, as Timothy Snyder and others have pointed out, that those policemen that were recruited those Ukrainians who were recruited into the German police as auxiliaries in, for example, in Volhynia, there's no way they could not have been complicit in the Holocaust. Because in 1942, 200,000 Jews were murdered. And these policemen, even if they were not shooting the Jews, they were hurting them, directing them, collecting them, transporting them, creating the ghettos, they had to have seen and known what was going on. So when they defected to the UPA, they took that knowledge with them, and that's an additional argument why the ethnic cleansing of Poles was so brutal. They had learned certain techniques. And they, they and probably many of them had to have actually participated one way or another, in one way or another in the Holocaust. Well, there's a, a lot more complicated arguments that can be made, but just to summarize, one can say that in Ukraine, 1.4 million Jews were killed, mostly with a bullet to the, head, to the back of the head. This was not camps, Auschwitz, this was, this was a killing operation. Uh, the murder of Jews in Ukraine and the former Soviet Union is generally called, is now known as the Holocaust by bullet. That's how they were mostly, mostly executed. 1.4 million Jews were killed. In all, Ukraine lost between 5.5 and 7 million people during the war. So the Jews were 17 to 22 percent of that total. I should also say, and this is a strong argument in my view, there's not a single document by either wing of the of the Oun, at the Menik or the Bandera wing of their own, uh, saying that the violence against the Jew, Jews had to be stopped or prevented. Not a single document. They nowhere spoke out against this. So after the war. There was a split in the own, uh, it, and, and you know a democratic democratizing group did come out of it. They struggled to change the the, the, the structure of the party, the uh, the way the party developed, and they eventually had to leave. And that group is an interesting one. It called itself Own Z for Zakordonyi Chastene, Western. Uh, Units. It uh, produced the best journal, Suchastnist, uh, following events in Ukraine, and it had a very interesting publication house called Prologue. In fact, it educated a whole generation of people. They also came out of the Oonbe, but their evolution later was very different. So, what you have is a rather complicated picture after the war. You have both authoritarians and liberal-minded people claiming the same heritage. We came out of the Oun, we were part of the Oun, but you know, one group is saying we're liberals, we're democrats, and the other is still you know, hanging on to authoritarian principles. So when you get to um, the Maidan, you get a different view. And I'm going to suggest that the Maidan, Euromaidan, and contemporary Ukrainians tend to forget 
the, this history that I just explained to you, the bad history. What they tend to remember is something else. A book was written recently by uh, Katharina Gusev, and it's about uh, the uh, Zakarzonia, the areas of what is in fact Poland, but Ukrainian ethnic settlements in Poland. And this is, those are the areas that were cleansed. So here you have uh, Pereleshul and that area just inside the Polish border. There are three areas. You've got the, the northern area, which is Kholmszczyna and uh, Lublin Kholmszczyna area. And then you've got the Pereleshul area further to the south. And then a little bit further, you've got the Lenko area. So these three areas here, here, and Lenkishina, which runs along the Czechoslovakian border, were Ukrainian. They were cleansed 44 to, to 47. And here, the, and it was brutal. Uh, there were like uh, tens in, and hundreds of thousands of people were expelled. Uh, and some of them murdered. Population transfer was a policy that both the Soviet Union and Poland had decided on. They had decided to homogenize their populations. So Poles were to, all Poles in the Soviet Union were to go to Poland. All Ukrainians from Poland were to go to Ukraine. There's like 800,000 Poles, half a million Ukrainians, and it, it really some of it worked, but a lot of it did not work. People did not want to go. The Ukrainians who went, uh, first Ukrainians who went, saw the collective farms, they came back. They told everybody. And the rest did not want to go. There was fierce resistance. Uh, about 150,000 people in the provincial area fought. And that's where the UPA, who had been pushed out of Ukraine, found a refuge. They became the backbone of the resistance, the military, disciplined, organized force. And the locals uh, supported them. You had two ideologies. One of them, the Upaz ideology, was we are fighting for an independent Ukraine, a nationalist ideology. Right? But for the locals, we're fighting to remain where we are. I don't think many of these locals really thought a lot about uh, you know, the, 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 the macro ideology. They were interested in micro ideology, just help us survive. Show me how to use a gun, I'm ready to fight. They were very badly destroyed. And then the, the Polish army moved on Lemkivshina. The Lemkos were a bit ambiguous about whether they were Ukrainians or not, but certainly this operation, Operation Vistola or Aktia Vistola, uh, cleared them out. But, uh, I know 150,000 or more were shipped out, scattered all around along northern and western Poland to force them to assimilate. By that time, the Poles had given up on the idea of exchanging populations. And uh, Katarina Gusev points this out very well. So you have, I think, what most Ukrainians today would say a heroic episode in the uh, the, the world of, in the history of the UPA. I can give you some of the statistics on this, but uh, we'll leave that for later. Now, the last part of my talk is about how it's been depicted. So, uh, one of the leaders of all UPA, Levitt, wrote this book in '44. It's a bit of a, it's a propaganda thing, but it's, uh, it's uh, a book that's still read. Uh, and you have graphic art. This was an underground artist, Neil Kasevich, who uh, produced these graphics, which are now very famous, uh, showing the heroic world of the UPA. Uh, fight for freedom, it says, Volyam Narodam, Volyam Deni. Freedom for peoples, freedom for the individual. Uh, it shows victims, Ukrainians as victims, never as victimizers. It shows, Neil Chasev uh, shows Dmitro Peshkivsky, this Klim Stavur, who was head of the UPA in uh, Volin. 
life. Even the stamps that were produced, the postcards that were produced, the art was produced, all showed this heroic uh, aspect. So you have Khomschina, uh, Peremishin, you know, these areas that Ukrainians were fighting for. You've got the head of the UPA, Tras Chuprenka, uh, Shukhevich, is his real name, as a hero. And even on postcards. So you have the soldier of Easter cards. You've got the soldier uh, produced by Edvard Kozak, famous Ukrainian artist. It's this heroic portrayal. And this is what is sunk in. This is the image that became dominant in the 50s, 60s, and later. And it, I mean, there's some, some aspects of this that one can really identify with. The uh, Christmas, with the soldier being greeted, the people bringing uh, food to the soldiers hiding in the forests. This is by Svetoslav Hordinsky, another very well-known artist. Uh, you've got this idea of the soldier, Ukrainian soldier, through the ages. Uh, fighting for for freedom. So my conclusions are this. I'm, I'll try and keep it short. When we use the term Bandere, uh, it has many meanings. I can give you four basic meanings that it has acquired over time. In Soviet accounts, it was just another term for a nationalist. All nationalists of Bandarivtsi, right? They are they are really sort of bandits. Also the same the same attitude in Poland. But then there's a second view, and that is those people who fought um, the deportations, the armed resistance to deportations, the UPA half of whom were members of one, there's speculation, but about half of them probably members of the Old Bet, and the Bandarites. Then in the post-war, <coughs> Old Bet refers to just another political party, a rather small one, not a particularly significant one, and in fact a political party that was ostracized by most of the intellectuals, Ukrainian intellectuals in immigration. They published very little of interest. They weren't, you know, particularly in mind. They were viewed also as sectarians, people who uh, refused to cooperate with others. So they were a minority that was even shunned politically. So that's a, in the emigration, very often how people thought of the, the Bandarites. And then, the fourth view of Bandarimtsi is the Euromaidan view. Suddenly, the Russian media started calling all these nice young people who were demonstrating for civil rights, Bandarimtsi, Bandarites, fascists. And very often, they would reply, okay, if, uh, if, if fighting for an independent Ukraine, if fighting for civil rights and democracy is bound right, then I'm a Bandarite. Who cares? Even the Jews, who were very active supporting the Euromaidan, began calling themselves Judeo Bandarites, Judeo Bandarites, right? Okay, wear, wear it with honor. So these are very different concepts of what, uh, what the word could mean. And it has now taken on, the, 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 the conflict has now taken on uh, some ugly tones. So you have people in Poland calling all Ukrainians uh, of this, uh, nationalists of, uh, fighting for independence or fighting against Polish rule as being uh, brutal monsters, uh, descriptions of uh, of uh, brutal peasants uh, massacring the population, 
they, some have even called it the Polish Holocaust and blamed it on Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, a pretty ugly image of Ukrainians has, has developed in some places. This is a tradition, actually, because if you look back on uh, Henrik Sienkiewicz's book, With Fire and Sword, uh, there's some pretty ugly descriptions of Ukrainians in there as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that, an image that uh, a lot of people are prepared to accept because they've assimilated it from, from literature. So that's my conclusion. I think that we're dealing with a, a very polarized debate, but uh, a debate in which people are identifying with different images of, uh, of uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainians who are fighting against uh, uh, the Soviets or Ukrainians who are fighting against the Poles, but also a different image of uh, uh, who the Ukrainians were, who the resistance was at different moments in time. And it's a complicated uh, business. I think that only after independence, after 91, was an opportunity finally created for a free, open discussion and debate. That free, open discussion and debate is now taking place. But it is coming up against resistance from agendas, political agendas, that already existed in 91 and still exist today. So that's in brief uh, my talk. If you want to read more, I, d I have written about the old woman and about um, the, uh, the nationalist movement. Uh, I have a book out, Creating Nationalism. 1929 to 1956, and I talk about whether, to what extent, uh, you could say that in the 30s, uh, the Aoun was racist or was fascist. They rejected those, those terms. But the leadership of Aoun rejected them. The leadership lived in Prague, in Berlin, in Rome. And it was made up of uh, former officers of the Ukrainian Galician Army, the Sichuvistriti, the Sharpshooter Regiment. They were older people. The young guys, the hotheads in Galicia, were much more prone to accepting uh, the propaganda that was coming out of Germany. The people around Stepan Bandera in, in, uh, in Galicia. And in, in about 1939 to 1941, they were tempted. They were the ones that began reading Don Sof and began you know, shifting towards a uh, sympathy for Germany position. That's about, I think I should end it there, and then I can, you can ask questions. Than, than it used to be. 
they are very, very much, uh, very angered by any attempt of Ukrainians to, to, uh, to speak about, to, 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 to be apologetic about events in Volhynia. But at the same time, they don't talk about what happened in the Zakhersonia, that element, that period of time. So there's, you know, there's a problem there. But the key thing is um, this sense that Ukrainians need to acknowledge their guilt in Volhynia with the Poles. Other scholars who look at, who are interested in the Holocaust are very concerned that Ukrainians are not prepared to acknowledge guilt or some degree of guilt vis-a-vis um, -vis participation in the Holocaust. And that would be a completely different group. That might be German scholars, that Jewish scholars, you know, that might be a whole different uh, group of people. So you have a, a, a range of, of, of things going on. In Ukraine, there would be a similar range. So the, the, the most uh, moderate and respected scholars, Isleyevich, Hretak, people like that, are quite prepared to acknowledge that Ukrainians were, you know, they, they have a, a burden of guilt, particularly in Volhynia and around the Holocaust. But um, there are people like Vyatrovich who uh, now leads the uh, Institute of Memory History, who uh, takes a very strong line. He's basically a, a, a Banderite apologist, the uh, apologist for Ban uh, the Bandera faction. Uh, and that's where the, the, the conflict in Ukraine is. Yeah. yeah, so I, have a, I don't know if it's a whole different kind of worms, but I mean, I know that when, when the Ukrainians came out to the war here, you had also the, you also had the people who were involved in the Galician division. Right. Uh, how, are they, how do they view the UPA members? Well, that's an interesting question, because the underground uh, was opposed to the creation of the division. They didn't want their young men going to the division. They wanted them to go into the woods and fight for independence. It was suicide, basically. How long can you live in? I, I couldn't even survive a weekend, you know, in, in the forests. But you're supposed to fight for, for an independent Ukraine. Many people couldn't do it. They had a difficult choice. And many people deserted. They went to the forests of the Upad and, and left. Um, but they were originally opposed. Um, the logic behind joining the division was various, but um, the usual explanation given is that they wanted to learn to be professional soldiers. They wanted the best training they could have so that they could then defect, desert, or to take that training, take their army, and make it the nucleus of an army fighting for independence. So everybody knew that Germany was going to lose after 43. It was only a question of time. So the idea was that when Germany collapses, an anarchic situation will be created, and that will be an opportunity to, uh, to fight for independence. And towards the end of the, the war, the underground and the division began to communicate and began to see the possible, hope for the possibility that they will be able to fight for independence. Um, that's the standard explanation. I have a feeling that for many young men, uh, there wasn't really a lot of choice. In uh, 1944, in the spring of 1944, as the Red Army is coming in to Western Ukraine, <coughs> what were your options? Your options were to remain, in which case you would be taken into the Red Army and you would be driven in the front lines, often with no guns, 
cannon, cannon fodder against your own people. Uh, your options were to go to Germany to work in you know, slave labor, basically, um, or to join the division. And in fact, in many villages and towns, the only males, young males who survived were the ones who joined the division, because that was a, a, at least a sort of an ordered retreat out of the country. It's a very complicated history, and that's, uh, I'm actually writing, uh, studying, and, and beginning to write about the division right now. It's a very, very uh, difficult uh, uh, period of history, and uh, the, even the relations with the, the nationalists in, in, the, uh, in, in the division were complicated. So you talk about options, and it's either this side or that side. In, in 44? In, in, in general. Oh, you in, mean in, in, yeah. in the way the, the nationalists are seen? Are yeah. Viewed. yeah. And I wonder, I wonder what happens if someone takes both sides at the same time. These are good and these are good, or these are bad and these are bad, it doesn't matter. And, and, and I think uh, one that almost bothers me, uh, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, which says that they represent all Ukrainians, in quotes, whatever that means. Uh, they, they recently released a, a press release, the Ukrainian Canadian Cong Congress, out of wherever it is, uh, on or Toronto, I don't know where they are these days, where they, uh, and it says that they're, they're, this was about the Holocaust, and the statement was that, that the Holocaust was where the Jewish people died, and the Ukrainians, and gypsies, and, and others, in other words, the, the Holocaust was not a one, one group. And, and that, that, is sent, that is told, that is uh, as a standard press release by the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. We, the, yeah, there was a Holocaust, of course there was. It was a genocide, and we suffered too. On yeah, the other side, on, on, on the other side, the same group, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, uh, supports literature, books, uh, and I, I remember one in particular where it's about the Holodomor. And the Holodomor says where millions of Ukrainians were killed. Right. Nobody else. Just us. Yes. It's yes. interesting that so on one side, we, we, we want to be part of the, we want to be one, a, a victim there, but on the other one, we don't let anyone else be a victim. Yeah, I mean, you have to complicate these narratives. So they're much more complicated than, than those standard lines. And, and actually, <laughs> I've tried to point, as I've tried to point out, you could be uh, a criminal at one point, uh, a, a war criminal, a person who uh, does terrible things, and then you can later in another place have a, a different history. You you can be victim and victimizer at the same time. It's a complicated picture, uh, and to be open and honest about it is is not that not that easy. It's very hard if you're, and Ukrainians were victims, Ukrainians uh, suffered during the war term. But how do you uh, place your victimhood next to perhaps a much greater victimhood of Polish population, peasant population that is being exterminated, or Jews who are being exterminated, or uh, people in the in Ukrainians in Poland who are being shipped out, you know, it's a it, it's a very complex business, and to be able to integrate all those narratives and be fair and be be uh, be uh, understanding of what other people are going through is not an easy process. We have to develop a, a multi-layered, a multi-level narrative that allows us to be able to understand all. It's beginning. People are now writing novels, and more complicated novels. And there's even a, an interesting film or two that will be produced. Uh, but we have to learn to think in a complicated way, not in a simplistic way. 
Just one more question. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, I think maybe a little bit off topic, but since we're talking about standard and simplicity and complication, I've been dying to ask somebody what, I mean, in your research, how believable is the standard mind that comes from some camps that, uh, that the division was really the main force in suppressing the uh, ghetto uprising in Warsaw? Oh, that's completely false. Completely false. Well, that's good to hear. That's completely <laughs> false. No, that is now, no, nobody accepts that. Okay, good. That, that, there's been all sorts of myths yeah. about what the division did, mm -hmm. uh, where it was and all that. And, and early on, that was one of the myths. Okay. But no, nobody today accepts that. I mean, that's, that's the best news not tonight so far. Right. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'll tell you, there's a good film now that you should see. It's called Cold War. Oh, yes. Wait, but it's, it's, it's out right now, yeah. yeah. I'll tell you why. Uh, you won't hear this analysis if you read any of the reviews. But it's a film about Lemkivshtina. Mm -hmm. It begins in the Lemko area in a ruined church. And the girl, is, is, it is suggested, is one of the Lemkos that has been thrown out. So she's ready to become a pole to survive. She's ready to do anything. So, and she's a, she is a survivor. She's clever, she's good looking. She becomes a dancer and a singer in a Polish, post-war Poland, which is returning to a sort of a national, national affirmation of its national culture. Uh, and she kind of joins in. There's also, she falls in love with a pianist who is a jazz pianist and a person who's, uh, you know, escapes to the West, to Paris. He's an outsider, she's an outsider. They're in love, they get together again. I don't want to spoil the movie for you, but at the end, it ends back in Lemkivshina, back in the ruined church. And the last line of the film is, let's go over there, let's see how things look from that side. And that side, I interpret as, as let's go way back to when they were, began driving out the Lemkos in 1947, and you know, cleanse this whole area. Let's look from there at that point of view now. Was it worth it? Where did we get? Where are we going? Now, I don't think a lot of viewers, particularly uh, viewers who are not aware of the history, would get that, those references. But I think they're there. She sings Lemko songs. Uh, she is, uh, she's, uh, she's, uh, she's identified as not completely Polish, you know. Um, I think there's a lot there. And this is a kind of a, a guilt complex within the Polish uh, community now, which is trying to work through its sense of guilt. I think Ukrainians need to do something similar, and then you can have a convergence, you can have uh, an open discussion. Thank you so much. We could, um, you have a way of um, braving together narratives that leave us wanting much more. And, uh, and I thank you for sharing a little bit of that brave with us tonight. Hope that we can have you back again. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, it's not a warm night. Uh, we hope that you'll stick around and have a bit of coffee and chat. I also want to thank Yvonne, our famous cameraman there, for doing your work with us and Julia for organizing things. So um, again, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Here.